everybody, and welcome to another Awake Facebook recorded event. My name is Kevin Bradley, and tonight I must apologize, I had camera issues, but in the essence of time and everybody else that are on the panel's time, we thought we would go ahead with just uh, my voice recording. So I'm so happy to be here tonight. Uh, we're doing Heart Healthy Month because it is February, and after all, Valentine's Day is coming up. So we are doing um, a topic tonight on heart failure and the relationship between heart failure and sleep apnea. Again, I'm delighted to have Justine Amder on board. Welcome, Justine. Hello. And of course, Teresa Schumard as well is also um, on board with us tonight. Hello. Just, hello, Teresa. <laughs> and Justine, I'd really love for you, we are delighted as well to have Eugenia Brooks here. We interviewed Eugenia last year, and um, which was a very um, well thought of and successful um, awake presentation. So Justine, if you don't mind, could you actually introduce Eugenia and the reason why she's here, please? Yes, uh, Eugenia Brooks uh, became part of our sleepapnea.org community when she served as a patient panelist on the um, AWAKE initiative that we had in 2018 for the FDA. Uh, she uh, was able to tell her story uh, of getting diagnosed with sleep apnea and the other co co-occurring conditions that she had uh, and describe that to uh, to the FDA on behalf of all patients. Um, and so we uh, are happy that uh, our relationship grew from there. She has uh, joined sleepapnea.org. She is our featured blog writer. So if you haven't checked out her blog posts, we have those on our website. And uh, she's just a great asset for our organization to have um, as, uh, as a patient advocate with the rest of the team here. So we're happy to have Eugenia here with us tonight uh, because she definitely has personal experience in regards to her heart health and sleep apnea. Great, Eugenia. And we're so happy you joined us again. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Always a pleasure to be here. Okay, great. All right. So before I start, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, the, I did do some research and tried to make um, things about heart failure and the correlation between obstructive sleep apnea, um, more layman's term friendly. And um, I do want to add as a disclaimer that any information that you get here and you feel that maybe you have some of these symptoms uh, you need to talk to your uh, healthcare specialist, uh, your primary care physician, your GP, and discuss those with them, okay? So when we look at this, our objective today is to discuss heart failure and the definition basically of heart failure and congestive heart failure, it happens when your heart becomes weaker. Now, when people hear the word, fa the word sorry, failure, it doesn't mean to say that your heart has actually stopped working. What it means is your heart has become weaker. So it may not pump enough blood to meet the needs of your body. Blood that should be pumped out of your heart backs up into your lungs and other parts of your body. And this can cause shortness of breath and or swelling of your feet and legs. Now there are treatment options that are readily available and are tailored to meet your severity of the symptoms. Heart failure can be described as mild to severe, depending on the cause and symptoms. Okay, so some heart failure facts. You know, currently there's about 3 million cases of heart failure reported each year. And with an aging population, this number is set to increase. Blood tests and cardiac imaging allows your practitioner to give you a firm diagnosis, although signs and symptoms are usually the first indicator. And we'll actually discuss those later because they're quite important. Congestive heart failure usually happens when the heart or other heart problems are uh, occurring. Although there is no known cure, uh, treatment is geared towards alleviating the symptoms of what we would call fluid overload. So if we look at some of the causes of heart failure, for instance, if you've suffered a heart attack and blood supply has been reduced or blocked to the heart muscle, 
that can cause heart failure just by having that damaged heart. Heart valve problems like a tight or leaky valve may also result in heart failure if untreated or if surgical options aren't indicated. Abnormal heart rhythms called arrhythmias can also lead to heart failure. And cardiomyopathy, which was an enlarged heart muscle, that happens when the heart muscle is weakened because of a viral infection, for example, or toxins that you may have been exposed to, like chemotherapy, or even as a result of heavy drinking, um, too much alcohol. Now, long-standing high blood pressure is a concern as well, because that can be a major contributor to heart failure. This happens as the heart has to work or pump harder against the resistance in the vessels, causing the heart mus muscle to become enlarged. And that's also known, and you may have heard the term, left ventricular hypertrophy. And really that means that the heart's had to work so hard, and it is a muscle after all, that it becomes enlarged. Pearly diabetes can also be a contributor to heart failure. And um, of course, heart failure can also be caused as a congenital component or something that you're just born with and predisposed to. So when we look at it, people with sleep apnea or OSA are more likely to have problems with the rhythm of their hearts, a heart rate that is either too fast or too slow, for instance. And people with severe OSA are actually four times more likely to have atrial fibrillation, which is an odd beat of the heart, if people aren't familiar with that term, and it's not in sync, than those without sleep apnea. So people with sleep apnea are more likely to have coronary artery disease, which can lead to a heart attack, which then can lead to heart failure. So sleep apnea, like we can see here, can play a major role in the onset of developing heart failure, and untreated sleep apnea can both lead to heart failure and make heart failure actually the symptoms worse. So effective treatment of OSA with continuous positive air pressure can improve cardiovascular outcomes and obviously ward off these risks. So before I bring uh, Eugenia on board, I'm actually going to just discuss, it's important for people to know and recognize some of the symptoms of heart failure. So the symptoms of heart failure may actually come and go over time. The most common symptoms of heart failure are fatigue and shortness of breath, particularly with exertion. Patients with heart failure tend to retain fluid, like I said earlier, and this fluid can accumulate in the legs causing swelling. It can also back up into the lungs causing shortness of breath. When someone with heart failure retains too much fluid, his or her symptoms obviously worsen. They may experience some sudden weight gain, which could actually be as much as two to five pounds in as little as one to two days. So this is why it's so important to understand the importance of actual sodium restriction or salt restriction and fluid restriction in your diet. Think of it like salt attracts water, which in turn stays in your circulatory volume, which increases that fluid overload, which you either can back up into your lungs or your lower extremities, like your feet, ankles, or legs. Some of the other symptoms that people report are frequent dry hacking cough, which may be more common when lying down and can be a result of heart failure. Some people with congestive heart failure also cough up what we would refer to as frothy type sputum that can be or cannot be blood tinged. So as a blood supply and oxygen is reduced to the vital organs, some people may actually experience feeling tired after doing something that is normally simple or easy to them. As blood and oxygen may be compromised to the brain, some people may have bouts of confusion and disorientation. Some people have also reported experiencing dizziness, fainting spells, and obviously have trouble sleeping at night because of the breathlessness and need to be propped up with one or two pillows. So Eugene, at this point, Eugenia, sorry, at this point, I actually wanted to include you in this, obviously, and see if any of those symptoms related to you. Absolutely. Um, 
it brings back memories. Uh, one incident that I remember where it all came together like a perfect storm. Um, I had been to the doctor for a checkup and about two weeks later, the leg swelling was out of control and the dizziness, okay, and feeling like I was going to be faint. The AFib was out of control and uh, acting out. And one night I was just feeling so bad. Um, I was frightened and I called to go to the emergency room and uh, the congestive heart failure was acting up. And uh, the you talk about the water weight gain. When I had gone to the doctor less than two weeks prior, I was 50 pounds lighter. I didn't know about the rapid weight gain. In fact, I didn't know much about any of it because I hadn't had a problem with it before. Um, but the rapid weight gain, okay, stood out because I gained in less than two weeks, 50 pounds. And it was all water. And they put me on a, you know, a diuretic. <laughs> yeah. The next couple of days, okay, I was very active back and forth to the bathroom. But, I mean, all that water came off and it was, it was all water weight. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the shortness of breath, I felt that because I was taking on all that extra weight suddenly. Um, of course, it made my arthritis act up because suddenly there was all this extra weight that my, you know, my body wasn't normal, normally used to carrying around. So, yes, it, it, it's all very familiar. Yeah. Well, Eugenia, you know what? Go ahead, uh, Justine. Eugenia, can I ask you, um, what, what were you diagnosed with first? Uh, uh, I was with diagnosed your heart? with, you know, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea first. And to be honest with you, um, I wasn't getting the proper machines that the doctors were prescribing. And I didn't know the difference from what was new, what was old, what was good, whatever. And so whatever I was being given, I would just simply take. And it wasn't working because it was antiquated. So that sleep apnea for quite some time was carrying on basically poorly treated. And so it created the stress on my system that brought about both the CHF and the AFib eventually. Right. You know, and that, that is very typical, like we had said before with the symptoms. Um, I'm glad you did highlight the rapid weight gain because some people are like, what is going on with me? And I was shocked because I all I knew was that my I was having sudden trouble with my breathing. I mean, I had COPD, but it was a very mild case. It, regardless, it was just out of nowhere. I suddenly was having all this trouble breathing. I suddenly, my, my arthritis had gone from zero to 60 in terms of pain. Um, and I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. Um, and then this general lousy feeling of not well-being, and then the the irregular heartbeat and all of this stuff uh, to get in the emergency room in the hospital to find out that this is what had played out. So, so that that's that's pretty extreme. And actually, Teresa, in your your um, tenure with seeing patients as well, and clinics and stuff. Have you ever come across similar situations like this, like Eugenia's story? Yes, and I felt so terrible for this gentleman, but he uh, sometimes back, you know, and it maybe still happens that when you have a sleep study with a CPAP titration, sometimes they will give the mask to you because they can't reuse it on anybody else, and they'll just give you the mask at the lab, and you know, then you'll have an extra one at home or whatever. And this gentleman went home and he did what he thought he was supposed to do. And I guess that the lab hadn't 
heard anything from the DME and the DME wasn't communicating anyway. Sad story. They didn't deliver his machine. But he thought if he just puts that mask on like he did at the hospital that, you know, and here the little person was just, you know, probably really having a tough time breathing with that heavy mask on with no, you know, incoming air. So, yeah. And so he said something to, well, I'm not feeling any better, you know, and they found out that he didn't have a machine. But that was, you know, he just didn't know he was new to it. Well, I mean, you know, that's that's patient reality. You know, we we're not the professionals and we don't know what to expect or what to think or do. And professionals, on the other hand, are so used to being around it all the time. I guess maybe they forget who they told what to and they just kind of generally think that we're going to get it by osmosis or something. And we really don't. They really need to take the time to break it down with each one of us and explain clearly what to expect. Because when we don't know, just like in my case, I didn't know one way or another about the machines. I didn't know anything about the machines except they told me to use it. And when I got it, that's what I did. But it was an antiquated machine. And it was no longer being supported by the company. I didn't know. And so my treatment was poor. And now my doctors were losing their minds when I came in with all of this stuff going wrong. And, you know, it wasn't anything that I was doing or not doing. It was the fact that the machine that I had was not working properly. Right. You know, and that's, you know, that's why we're, we're looking at this because we want to see the relationship between sleep apnea and um, heart failure There's also, when I did some research, you know, that's interestingly enough proven that some people with cardiac disease, like heart failure that develop through other reasons, can go on to develop sleep apnea. My theory in looking at some of that is like, which did come first, which was, you know, going back to Justine's question as well. So was it the heart condition that caused the sleep apnea or vice versa. And I tend to think we all the information that we're getting recently, a lot of these things can be attributed to um, poorly controlled or undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea. In my case, it definitely was. There is no heart problems in my family, period. Right. And I had none. All my youth and it first half of my adult life. And I did not have any heart issues when the sleep apnea was diagnosed. And in fact, it took several years for them to develop. Several years with me not having a properly working machine. Yeah. Well, you know, that leads me now into the treatment options. And, um, you know, I feel now that luckily with a, a swift diagnosis and uh, treat op- treatment options, there luckily are many options out there for people with uh, heart failure. And um, we can look at that from a point of view that understanding it has come a long way over the last few decades. And um, there's a lot of research out there that have shown that People can live longer and healthier and happier lives um, and avoid being admitted to hospital, sorry, when they actually do receive some treatment. So the establishment has, um, establishing, sorry, a healthy lifestyle is an essential part of managing heart failure. Because, you know, if your heart is not functioning normally, your body is not able to deal with the extra amount of stress or exertion that's put onto it. So this means as well, like I talked about earlier, sodium restriction, fluid restriction, exercise, all these things are going to help you alleviate some of the symptoms. So again, like I said, do pay attention to your sodium or salt intake and don't add any salt to your um, cooking. And also watch the labels that you read as well and buy in the store. 
So other healthy lifestyle changes that are, have a positive effect include, again, regular exercise and managing stress levels. There's a number of medications, of course, that have been shown to improve how you feel. And like you said, Eugenia, diuretics or things like, you know, you've heard the word of Lasix or ferrosamide, mm -hmm. water pills, they all help prevent that accumulation of water that backs up either into your lungs or lower extremities. Some people even say they've had fluid buildup, you know, in their abdomen. It, it's dependent. We call this a dependent edema. So if you're on your feet all day, that fluid will sink to your ankles. So with diuretic therapy, that can help alleviate some of these symptoms. But of course, that comes with a lot of you need to go to the bathroom a lot, you know. So I'm sure you can attest to that. And, you know, finally, but more extreme, there are devices out there such as special pacemakers or cardiac um, implantable machines that help the, the, the um, heart pump slower and stronger. So, Eugene, I'm just curious if you wouldn't mind sharing some of the treatment options and, and um, uh, treatments that you're actually on at the moment and how they've affected your symptoms. Oh, yes. Well, as I said, they put me on a diuretic right away um, to get that water off of me quickly. Uh, and, you know, once I got home, I tweaked my diet a bit. I, I never was big on uh, eating salt to begin with. But uh, like you say, you know, the shortcut meals, you know, the out of the box, you know, out of the container in the freezer case and stuff, you really have to be careful. When you, when you start reading the labels and looking at, you'd be surprised at the different foods that are just loaded with sodium that you wouldn't even think would be, but they are. So you have to be mindful of what you're buying off the shelf. You know, read the can, read the label on the can, read the label on the box, the container, because you have to watch. Sometimes you're not even meaning to, and you're doing it to yourself. So you have to be mindful of that. And um, as much as I can, in spite of my other issues, I try to get out and walk and do some exercising to, you know, keep my system going. So, yeah. you know, it doesn't take a lot, okay? You just, you know, try to balance it out and do the best you can. But really, the biggest piece of advice I can give is to read your labels because there is just so much sodium being put into things the shortcuts, you know. Exactly. No, and that's great advice because it's the hidden sodium. It's not even, like I said earlier, don't add salt when you're cooking. There's a lot of alternatives out there. and um, But it's like, you know, if you eat out or like you said, some prepared meals, it's shocking how much sodium is in it, you know. It really is, like three and four and 500 milligrams of sodium exactly. in one single meal serving, you know, frozen or out of a box or whatever. And it's, you just wouldn't think it, but when you read the label, there it is, because they're forced by law to divulge it. So you really have to get yourself into the habit of being mindful and reading. And it just goes, push you in the direction to cook from scratch mm -hmm. yourself because see that right there you beat the game so much more because if you make it yourself and like you said don't put any in and my grandmother taught me this don't put any salt in while you're cooking salt belongs on the table salt and pepper belongs on the table not in your pot she used to always say that to me. You cook the food without the salt, and then if someone needs to, they can put it on themselves at the table. But it'll never be too much because it's being put on at the table. There's nothing else in it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that really fun. applies when you cook <laughs> from scratch. You can really you have control over that, and you can yeah. do that. So again, you know, with the all the things that we've talked about, I did want to look at the slide. You know, the relationship between sleep apnea and heart failure is quite um, uh, evident, like we've talked about. So during our conversation, I'm sure we've all learned that obstructive sleep apnea has been associated with hypertension, coronary artery disease, and cardiac arrhythmias. It can also lead to sudden cardiac death. And of course, then what we're talking about, this leads to heart failure. Sleep apnea leads to heart failure, sorry. So, you know, the immediate effects when we look at why that happens, if you try and think about it, if you're in bed and you're having an anapneic attack so the immediate effects of an attempted inspiratory effort during an episode of mechanical obstruction to airflow include an exaggerated drop in the pressure of the chest cavity and this can lead to hypoxia which is low oxygen level and then arousal which is like you wake up so basically, the way I always explain it is like this drop in pressure increases the workload of the heart, and that stresses the heart muscle. Again, another way of explaining it, if you think about it, like the heart is still pumping and trying to beat. But when you're stopping breathing, it's actually trying to beat against resistance because the lungs are collapsed and there's, the heart is still trying to pump and it is pumping. So, of course, that would lead to a decreased amount of blood flow that is being circulated. And then as a result of that, that causes blood to back up and that backs up into the lungs. OK, so with this obstructive sleep apnea, this also causes a marked and repeated elevation in blood pressure, as we've told before. So this combination of increased workload and faster heart rate leads to oxygen supply demand mismatch, which really predisposes the patient to reduced oxygen to the heart, causing arrhythmias, and then chronically to left heart enlargement, like we discussed before, which is also known as left ventricular hypertrophy, which then leads to heart failure. So a little bit again, what that means in layman's terms is basically, if your heart is trying to work harder and faster to beat against the resistant, uh, resistance, sorry, think about it again as a muscle. So that muscle, the harder it works, the bigger it's going to get. But as it enlarges over time, it becomes what we would refer to as a boggy heart. So even though the muscle is larger, it's not necessarily pumping adequate, adequate supply of blood to the arteries veins and vital organs that it needs. So, you know, more and more studies are showing that people with untreated sleep apnea are twice as likely to have a stroke and five times as likely to die from a sudden cardiac event, mainly related to what we've all discussed. In Eugenia's case, she also mentioned that she had atrial fibrillation. And of course, that's when the heart just beats out of sync. That atrial fibrillation can lead to blood clots, which then can lead to stroke. So this is why treatment is so important. Um, it's important to reduce your blood pressure and of course, lessen the strain of your heart. When we look at sleep disturbances, you know, snoring is obviously, you know, about 24% of women habitually snore, 40% of men do. And these numbers double, I would say, in the elderly population and those that are overweight as well. And snoring can do a lot more harm than just annoy your bedside partner. It can lead to poor sleep quality and quantity, of course. And we estimate that about 90 million Americans suffer from snoring. And as many as half of those may have a sleep store disorder like obstructive sleep apnea. But while obstructive sleep apnea almost always causes loud and irregular snoring, just because you snore doesn't always mean you have obstructive sleep apnea. But again, the likelihood is greater. And it's that time where you should see your medical advisor, your GP, your general practitioner, 
and ask for a sleep study so you can figure out what is actually causing it. So, you know, I, again, I appreciate having firsthand experience with someone who, you know, is always open and honest with um, their signs and symptoms of um, what happens when sleep apnea occurs and um, what other comorbidity conditions we can develop. But I think it's good to just review again. So I think like we talked about earlier on, early detection in any usual disease or comorbidity is always vital and key to good treatment options. So identifying and treating sleep apnea can improve survival and slow down the deterioration of heart failure. They always say a good night's sleep is important for a healthy heart, of course, and we all know that. In fact, studies show that poor quality sleep increases your risk of developing cardiovascular disease and can be a point of concern for those living with cardiovascular disease. Contrary to what people think, sleep isn't about the body shutting down. It's actually an active state of vital capacity for regulating many physiological functions. So when we get that good sleep, our body's actually, if you think about it, repairing itself. During the deepest sleep stages, blood pressure drops, the muscle relaxes, and the body's general repair process occurs. In deep sleep, the body releases various hormones that affect growth, appetite regulation, energy met metabolism, and glucose processing, as well as brain and muscle health. So just by that comment there, by understanding what good deep sleep does and all the many factors it, it um, repairs, you can see what bad sleep can cause. So if it's not regulating hormones that can lead to um, immune diseases, it can lead to diabetes, um, with growth appetite and regulation and energy, people can overeat, they're tired, Glucose processing, again, can lead to diabetes, as well as brain and muscle health can lead to things that people are relating to sleep apnea, like fibromyalgia, for example, and also Alzheimer's. So lack of sleep actually interrupts these effects, again, which disrupts the body's chemical and hormonal balance. Levels of cortisol, which as we all know is a stress hormone, insulin and other chemicals increase. And that does contribute to a greater risk of some of the diseases that I spoke of, like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, dementia, and Alzheimer's, and of course, as well as cardiovascular disease. So when people that already have some of these diseases, again, they always say a single night of poor sleep can cause an increase in blood pressure the following day. So if you're more predisposed or you have a diagnosis of hypertension or high blood pressure already, it is essential to get that good sleep. While addressing sleep problems helps to prevent heart disease, getting healthy sleep is important for people who already have these diseases. It's common for people who've had a cardiac event such as a heart attack to develop sleep problems even if they weren't prone to them before. Now, a lot of that is related to people that have had a heart condition or a heart attack or heart issues, have an anxiety related to that uh, diagnosis and therefore don't get the sleep that they need. So the insomnia rates of people that have a heart condition are estimated to be about two or three times higher than the general population. So I think now after this, we can see as heart failure continues to carry a significant morbidity and actually mortality rate, it is really crucial to pursue new types of therapy and addressing the sleep apnea seems to be a good point to start. So if you feel that you have any of the signs and symptoms of A, sleep apnea, which of course we know daytime sleepiness, not being able to focus, waking up in the middle of the night, you should always go and see your general practitioner and request a sleep study. But if you also feel that you've got any signs and symptoms of heart failure like we discussed, 
that is also key to go to your general practitioner and request um, further evaluation. So that's me for my presentation. I hope that's been beneficial to you. And of course, I just want to throw it out to my uh, panel that have kindly joined me tonight to see yeah. if there's any other comments. Yeah, I just, this is Justine, and I, I just want to, you know, tell our community, um, and you gave a lot of good summary information uh, here that, um, you know, sleep affects all types of health conditions that we pretty much have or see the common ones, dealing with uh, cardiac and heart, uh, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, uh, mental and emotional well-being and health, um, you know, those are the things that we talk about regularly. So, you know, we can't stress enough for, you know, individuals in our community to talk to their family and friends that are experiencing these conditions to also factor in the sleep component. You know, we all sleep for one third of our lives. And as you described, you're, it is not a uh, downtime where nothing is happening. It's actually, you might be running a marathon uh, with your heart uh, unknowingly because of something else that's going on uh, with some other uh, uh, condition. So uh, it's it's really important to to you know talk to your doctor, uh, talk to your family and friends, and and you know try to uh, link those up together uh, to get a better grasp on your overall health. Yeah. Great advice, Justin. And again, you know, as we go further into this and we all know ourselves, like you said, the general population, I feel like that when people go to bed at night and they try and get a good night's sleep, they feel it is a shutdown mode. Um, and it's important to realize that that sleep is essential for repair. Eugenia, any takeaway messages? Just... You know, keep in touch with your physician and your healthcare providers. Do what they tell you to do, but always check with them and make sure that you're getting what you're supposed to be getting when they prescribe things for you. Things have to be delivered. Bring your equipment to the office. Let them check it out after you first get it. You know, things like that can make all the difference in the world. Had I done that, I wouldn't have spent several years with non-operative equipment. Yeah, that's great advice. And it also leads me to our Awake Facebook page. And, um, you know, the American Sleep Apnea Association um, page that we we see great comments and help the people are, you know, out there asking their community for help with the situation. And again, like I repeatedly say, we all don't experience some of the things that other people are. And that's what makes it so valuable that people are out there willing to spend their time and help their peers, you know, or peeps for the one day a better word and um, give advice. And just help people through, you know, knowing that someone's there for them and has a similar situation is, is really beneficial. Exactly. I've spent all those years basically wandering around in the dark blind uh, without any access to any information. And I learned so much once I got connected. Great, great. And Teresa, what about you, the voice of reason and wisdom? Any takeaway <laughs> messages? <laughs> oh, you're in trouble. No, oh, no. <laughs> I, I, just, I just cannot stress enough and, and urge people out there in the community that may have sleep apnea, may think they have sleep apnea, may, may or may not have a comorbid condition, to really be their own advocate really check out because the way that insurance and everything is set up these days, the patient and the person, the individual has to be involved in their own healthcare regimen. You are the one that are going to make a difference. Uh, like you said, you know, you go to the doctor, you might be, you know, quickly rushed, whatever. I mean, you, it's so, so vitally important that you are empowered 
to uh, be your own advocate. And, you know, uh, if you don't, if you don't have that skill set, you can come to our support group and there's plenty of people there that'll help you. (laughs) So anyway. Great advice. Thank you, Teresa. And that's why we're doing what we do. So we can put that out in people's ears. We can educate. But again, like I said at the start of the presentation, this does not, you know, take the place of medical advice. We're not here to do that. If you feel your, you know, these symptoms or signs are familiar to you, we always ask that you seek uh, medical uh, assistance. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining me again. Um, Eugenia, thank you so much for your always open and honest um, Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Justin, always great to have you on board and Teresa as well. And um, I will leave you guys hoping that everybody gets a good night, restful and repairing. Nice sleep and um, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. See you all later. Bye. Happy Valentine's Day.